There's no sign of identity theft slowing down. And why should it? More than $29 billion were stolen from identity theft victims last year alone. To cyber criminals, it's a success story. To the rest of us, it's a wake-up call. Your personal info is in more places now than ever. And all that exposure can make it dangerously easy to steal your identity. LifeLock makes it easy to help protect yourself by monitoring your identity and alerting you to threats you could miss on your own. And if you do become a victim of identity theft, a U.S.-based LifeLock restoration specialist will be dedicated to your case and will work to fix it. Don't wait to get LifeLock identity theft protection. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year. Go to LifeLock.com slash ACAST. That's LifeLock.com slash ACAST to save 25% your first year. LifeLock. Identity theft protection starts here. This is a Stocks for Beginners quick tip. Essential lessons. Questions answered. Investors often fall in love with the story of a company without taking the next step, which is to then research the company and find out whether it really is good value. In this quick tip, Thomas J. Hayes from Hedge Fund Tips talks about valuing a business and how free cash flow is the most important metric. You could ask anyone who bought Peloton last year, what do they think about the story of story stocks, Teladoc, DocuSign? The story was, you know, everyone's at home, trees grow to the sky. There's a very popular fund in the U.S. that buys a lot of these innovative story stocks that you're betting on the future of growth. And I was looking at this ETF objectively. I was just looking technically. And I said, wow, this looks like it's really oversold and it looks like it's due for a bounce. So then I went and I did the work on the top 30, 40 names. I found one company in there that had $74 million of revenue that was trading over five billion dollars market cap. So I said, eh, that's probably not due for a bounce. <laughs> and many, many of these stocks were trading at 15, 20 times, even after the fund was down some 57% in the last 12 months or 60% in the last 12 months. And this was a very popular name. I don't want to single it out. But what I want to say is to do your homework, because Every single story in this ETF is compelling. It is the future. It is just like those 2000 automobile companies from 1920 to 1930 that went public and only two have made it without bankruptcy. Certainly Ford was the first. And then the second is Tesla. That's the only other automobile company that hasn't gone bankrupt at one point in its career. And 2000 did. So the story is one thing. The fundamentals is the other. You want cash generative businesses if you want to gamble on a couple of these things, and maybe you'll get lucky. But you know, the time to buy Amazon was not when it went public in 1994. It was when it was down 90% in 2001 and 2002. But if you looked under the hood, the earnings per share, the cash flow per share, the revenues per share were still growing, even though the stock was down 90%. All that had happened was the multiple contracted just as it had overshot in the tech bubble in 1999 and 2000, it undershot in the tech wreck in 2001 and 2002. And if you could have bought it at eight or nine bucks and whatever it's trading at made many hundreds of times your money, those are the type of opportunities. So it's okay to listen to the story because then you just have to do step two, which is do your work. Are these reasonable multiples? Are these reasonable expectations about the future? Is there any track record that I can bank on? Is it in favor? Is it out of favor? What's the sentiment around this? And then when you come to your own conclusion, then you can feel more comfortable putting capital to work when you've done your diligence. This story story about ETFs is really important as well because people tend to think that um, ETFs are quite safe, but often they are marketed as stories like this particular ETF, which I think we all know what you're talking about, <laughs> but will remain nameless. But stories are part of ETF marketing as well. Yeah, there's no question. And look, it may very well prove to be right. It's very interesting. The last decade from 2010 to 2020 was the only 10-year period in the history of public markets where you could buy a basket of stocks trading at 10 times sales and make money. Historically, that was a guaranteed way to lose your shirt. What changed was from 2010 to 2020, you were in a period of very historically low interest rates, declining interest rates, and that leads to a different 
respect for money. When capital has no cost, the natural effect is malinvestment. We saw it in the housing bubble from 2003 to 2007. We thought, saw it in the tech wreck from 95 to 2000. And this was the latest. So it may be the story stocks. It may be bonds. We'll see what it is. But I think that regime is changing. I don't think rates are going to go up dramatically, but I do think the direction is different than it's been in the last 10 years. When capital is free, you can put it anywhere. When capital has a cost, you demand a return on that capital because it's costing you to hold the money. So that return comes in the form of dividends. It comes in the form of buybacks. It comes in the form of generating free cash flow, generating earnings, not just a promise to grow the top line, keep losing money, and a promise that at some point in the future, the top line will be much higher and then they can have earnings. That doesn't work once capital has a cost. And in the last 10 years, it's been a unique environment in history where that game did work and people made really good money playing that game. But uh, I think the music may have stopped. Free cash flow is the most important metric in our view. It's the cash that a company generates after taking into consideration cash outflows that support its operations, maintain its capital assets, et cetera. So the reason free cash flow is so important to investors is because that's the money they use to return capital to shareholders through buybacks and through dividends, and also available capital if they potentially want to do accretive acquisitions that make sense. But predominantly, what's left to return to shareholders, whether they return it to shareholders or buybacks, is a function of free cash flow. And it's much harder to fudge cash flow than it is to fudge and adjust earnings. So that's a number we pay close attention to. And where do you find that number? I think you were just um, going through Yahoo Finance to find that number. Is that correct? Yeah, you can probably find it on different platforms like Yahoo. You know, it's effectively sales revenue minus operating costs plus cash flow minus required investments in, in operating capital. So any good screener should have a row that uh, delineates the cash flow. And how can you recognize what's a good free cash flow? What's the kind of number that you're looking for? Well, it's yield, and it really depends on the business. So based on different sectors, cash flow is going to be more or less important. So you know, free cash flow yield of 10%, that's very, very attractive. Question is, why does it have such a high free cash flow yield? And then you have to look at the business. Is there some impairment in the business? Is the business declining? A lot of things can be cured with free cash flow because you can just buy in the float. You can buy in shares to increase earnings when you have the cash generative ability. So It's the health of the business. In the short term, the market's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. Opinion always follows trend. So no one wants it now. When it's up double, everyone will want it. And that's when we'll start to lay off some of our stock. When it's up triple, everyone will want it. We already have in our mind our predetermined expectation of what fair value will be in the future. If the facts change, we'll change our mind. But on balance, at those levels is when we'll be peeling out of the stock. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Stocks for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Stocks for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free true crime to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads.